for God so loved the world that he gave. That's the fundamental part of everything. God is a giver. Therefore, God wants us to be givers. But you know what's more fun than being a giver? Being a judge. But God wants givers, not judges. Churches need givers, not judges. Look what he can... Notice where he put this promise and what he connected it with. Sometimes, boy, I tell you, we'll bring a wheelbarrow full of judgment, but only give to God a thimble's worth of our life. We should be as liberal in our giving as we are in our judging. If that was true, we'd be, boy, I tell you, we'd be great givers, wouldn't we? Notice what he said. And he spoke a parable to them. He's connecting it with this. This comes from his, what we call the Sermon on the Plain. If you read Luke, some people think that this is just a shortened version of the Sermon on the Mount. They think, oh, Luke just came in and recorded a little bit of it. No, if you have been in my class and we went through the life of Jesus, you'll remember there was a Sermon on the Mount. But as he began to finish his ministry up, he gave what he called the Sermon on the Plain as he was up by Sidon. And the folks from Sidon and all around came to hear him. And on the plain of Sidon, he preached this message to them. It was toward the end of his ministry. In the Sermon on the Mountain, he's looking as the king and pronouncing to Israel what is the standard for citizenship in the kingdom. But now as he comes into Luke, he is finishing his ministry. And now he says, wait, I'm not dealing with the Israel and what is their requirement. I'm talking to you, my followers. Not to the nation of Israel now, like it was in the Sermon on the Mount, but now to those who say they want to follow me. Here's what I'm expecting from you. I'm expecting you to be givers, not judges. He spoke a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone who is mature shall be less, or rather as his master. And why do you look at the splendor that is in your brother's eye, but not see the beam that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, that's fellow believers within the church, not the nation of Israel, but people in the church, those who Christ have died for, brother, let me pull the splendor out that is in your eye. When you yourself do not see the beam that is in thine own eye. Hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye. Then shall you see clearly to pull the splinter that is in your brother's eye. Judges, judging somebody. See, it's easy to see sin in other people, but not in ourselves. We compare everyone to us. First of all, we begin this comparison by the assumption that we're better than they are. The first assumption of hypocrisy is, I am better than you. Once that's understood, now let me point out a few faults that you have. Right? Now, each one of us, if we all took a turn and you stood up here and you said, let me point some, some problems that I see with Nathaniel. You could find one or two. Oh, he's, he, you know his biggest problem? He's handsomer than his dad. How can that be possible? But he is. The kid's too handsome. That's, that's a fault. He's just too plain too handsome. And he's got two of the cutest kids you ever did see. Right? That, boy, I, I could find faults like that all day. Then Nathaniel can come up here and he say, well, let me tell you a few faults. I'm going to point a few faults about Michael. He's too tall. Michael's just plain old, makes the rest of us look short. He's just too tall. And oh man, he's got three gorgeous kids. I only got two. Then Michael comes up and says, well, let me pick on Richard. Richard's just too handsome a guy, I got to tell you that. And he's got a story for everything and everybody. I wish I could be a storyteller like Richard can. I wish I had God doing those things. And we each, <laughs> okay, so we're not really finding fault in this story that I'm using, right? But we could sit there and really pick on each other if we wanted to. Because we start with the assumption that I am better than you. And let me tell you why I'm better than you. I don't do what you do. No, no, no. See, remember that guy who went to the temple to pray? And said, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Well, let's take, for example, like that uh, publican over there. I do this, I do this, I do this. That's our fault. It's not, we inherited it. 
when Adam fell in the garden, God said, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get the right to decide what you think is good and evil. That's why we all have a different standard. That's why you can't get anybody to agree on what's right and what's wrong half the time. Because we all have that idea, that opinion that we hold, what we think is right and wrong. And we'll find the wrong in others and never see any wrong in us because we've decided everything I do is right. Hypocrite. That's the first law of hypocrisy. I have got to be better than you or I can't judge you. But again, Jesus said, what the church needs is givers, not judges. Not people who will condemn. Givers, not judges, make disciples. And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my word and does them. I want to hold your thought for just a moment and take you to the next slide. Mm, I'm just a little bit too tall up there, huh? It says givers, not judges. <laughs> okay, it was just a little too tall on that slide. But it says givers, not judges. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good. Good people do good stuff. They say good things. A good person will never condemn you. A good person is going to find the good in you. That's what good people do. Good people see good in others. Good people see others better than themselves. Good people assume that they're the worst person in the room and everybody is better than them. That's what good people do. That's how good people think. They're always looking to put what the other person needs ahead of themselves. That's just the way good people are. That's the way they think. And that's the way they talk. You can't help it because the Bible says that that good, you know, it comes forth from your heart. The mouth says what the heart is feeling. If it's a good heart, it will say good stuff. But an evil man out of the evil treasure, the evil stuff, the thing that he hoards, the thing that he desires, a good man in this picture is looking to be like Christ. An evil man is looking to be like this world. And I got to tell you, Jesus and the world don't see eye to eye on things. You know that as a Christian. How much does the world not think like you do? How quick is the world to condemn you? How fast are they to say to you, oh, you bunch of hypocrites? Right? That's a, do you tell me you're a Christian? Oh, I don't, I, I don't go to church because I don't like to hang out with hypocrites. Oh, well, don't sit next to me then if you do come. Right. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart. Why? Because he's a giving person. Out of the good things of his heart. He's giving. He's giving kind words. He's giving praise to God. You meet him and you find something out about Christ. He's willing to share. But that evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. He's going to condemn you. He's going to judge you. Because he's not a giver. He's a hoarder, and that's the difference. Good people are givers. Evil people are hoarders. So to make themselves better, they've got to find fault in you. Because they're not going to become any better. So they're looking for a reason to stay miserable. And they're going to find that in finding a fault in you and a reason not to become like you. A reason not to become like Jesus Christ. A reason not to hang around with those who hang around with Jesus Christ. He's going to find that reason because he's evil. Evil people do evil things they can't help themselves. They say evil things. Even in the sweet words they use, you can feel the cutting edge. For out of the abundance of the heart is the good man or the evil man. Out of the abundance of the good man's heart, the good man speaks. Out of the abundance of evil in the evil man's heart, the evil man speaks. Why do you think in that room, a good man, Jesus Christ, 
an evil man, Judas Iscariot. A woman walks in, she opens an alabaster box and anoints the head of Jesus Christ. And he says nothing but good about this woman. She has come beforehand to anoint me to the burial. And this testimony, wherever the gospel is preached, this testimony about her will be shared. That was his promise and it's been kept throughout all these years. The evil man, because of the evil treasure in his heart, said, why is this waste? She poured it on the head of Jesus Christ, God himself. And the evil man said, why is this waste made? It's a waste to do any good thing for God. It is a waste to pour any of your time, your talent, your treasure upon Jesus Christ. It's a waste. Why bother doing that? You know what more you could do? You could keep all that. You could buy a bigger house, a faster car a nicer boat. You could buy, buy, buy. Why are you giving? That's the evil man. Because we are told he kept the bag and stole what was put in it. The evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. But what does Jesus say? And why call ye me Lord, Lord? And do not the things that I say. He's talking to you and me now. Oh, I follow the Lord. And so the Lord says to you, give. And you say, well, I don't want to follow that far. Uh, is there something else I can do besides being a giver? Uh, do you have any room for takers in the church? I'll be one of them, Lord. And God says, well, you know, really, I'm looking for givers. Givers, not judges. Well, I'll be a judge in the church. I'll go around and tell folks what's wrong with them. How about I do that? God said, I don't want that. But you know, that church got more folks walking around being judges than it's got walking around being givers. Because it's easy to be a judge. Who appointed you judge? As my mother would say, right? Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Notice this. Whosoever comes to me, comes to him. That's surrender. I was once walking away from Jesus Christ. I was heading down the path that the world had laid before me. And suddenly I heard his voice behind me and I stopped. And I fell on my knees. Threw up my hand. I surrendered. Whosoever cometh to me and hears my saying. You know... I could see Jesus way off in the distance. But in order to hear what he is saying, you've got to get close enough. You know, in a crowd, you can hear an awful lot of muttering. And so you move in a little bit closer toward those people, and then you can finally begin to hear what they are saying. Hearing or isn't listening. Hearing is an involuntary thing. You hear all kinds of stuff. You can hear the roar of the motor. You can hear the jets as they fly over. You can hear the cars as they go by. But to hear what I am saying, you have to actively engage yourself and listen. To listen, your eyes have to be up here. You have to be looking my direction. You have to do a conscious thing to make sure, are you getting what I am saying? People hear Jesus, but they don't hear what he is saying. They can hear the mutter of his voice. They know he's saying something. You know God's doing something out here, but we don't hear him because we're not paying close attention. They don't get it. Jesus, and those of you who have traveled through my study on the life of Christ, how many times did Jesus say, I am going to Jerusalem to die? I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to beat me. They're going to spit upon me. They're going to nail me to the cross. And yet when he gets there, his disciples said, what? We didn't know that was going to happen. One lady who came and anointed him to his burial. Mary, she knew. Why? Because we're told that Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and heard him gladly. She listened to what he had to say. We hear God speaking, but we're not listening to what he is saying. So we're like the disciples who have heard Jesus say, I'm going to die, 
And yet, when he gets there, when he has said, I must die, I must die, I must be buried, I must raise again, yet Peter would say, you're not going to die, I won't let you. Well, you don't understand, if I don't die, people can't be saved. Well, don't worry, I won't let that happen. They didn't hear. Why? Because they didn't get close enough. Whosoever comes surrenders to me and hears me. See, that's discipleship. Discipleship is a, uh, it comes from the word a student, a learned, one who studies under the feet of somebody else. To be a disciple of Jesus Remember Jesus said to them, not to the apostles, but to those his listeners said, to be my disciple. To be one who has decided to follow me. One who listens to what I am saying, who really hears what I am saying, who understands what I am saying. Jesus said so often the multitude heard him, but didn't get it because he spoke to them in parables. And then he would take the parable, he would break it down for his listeners. So that they would walk away with a greater understanding. We have to take the Bible and not just hear it, but listen to what he is saying. We have heard God say, give and it shall be given unto you. But we didn't listen closely to where he said, I'd rather have givers than judges. We took and hoped for some miracle. If I believe this one verse and I give God money, God's going to give me ten times as much. That's what the preachers say on TV. Because what do they want? They want your money. God doesn't need your money. I got news for you. He wants you. They first gave themselves. They were disciples. Whosoever will give himself. That's what surrender is. The giving of one's self. Who hears my saying. That's discipleship. And does them. That's obedience. What is required in a steward? That a man be found faithful. That a man be found obedient. If I am obedient, I'd be obedient in all things. If I say to you, I had obedient children, you would assume they listened to everything I said. But maybe they only obeyed me in one thing. Maybe only when I said, would you go to the refrigerator and eat all the ice cream? Then my kids were obedient. Would you go to the refrigerator and drink all the soda? My kids were obedient. But if I said, would you go out in the backyard and mow the lawn and they didn't do it, were they obedient? No. But if I said to you, my children were obedient, you would assume, if dad said, go to the yard and mow it, that you would assume my kids went out in the yard and mowed it. You would assume if I said, eat your spinach, my kids ate their spinach. I'm glad my mom never said that to me. Because I'd have never ate my spinach. Papa, I tried for years to get me to eat me spinach. And I ain't done it to this very day. I don't like spinach. I'm glad God ain't told me to eat no spinach. I could tell you my children have been obedient to me. I want God to say of me that I have been obedient. If I tell you to do something like give, if I tell you something like don't be a judge, will you do those two things? Maybe we give, but we're still judges. See, we're not obedient. Obedience means I give and I refrain from judging. Or maybe I'm a judge, but not a giver. Still, same thing is wrong there. Because God wants one thing from me. Obedient. If I over, if I come to him and hear his sayings and do them. See, this is what he's looking for. When you read the word of God and you hear his word, you surrender to it, you hear it, you are obedient. Look what John told us of Jesus. This is Jesus' own word. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. If any man could be my judge, it's Jesus Christ. If any man could stand before the world and say, let me tell you about the faults you all have. 
and why I'm so... If anybody could say that, it was Jesus Christ. But who's the only man who never, ever stood up and said, here's why I'm better than you? Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read the letters of Paul. You never hear Jesus say, let me tell you why I am better than you. Even when he was dealing with the Pharisees, he never said, let me tell you why I'm better than you, buddy. Did he have the right? Could he have done it? Did he ever take that right? Did he ever do it? No. Because Jesus Christ was a giver. He gave himself on the cross for you and for me. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He was a giver. He first gave himself. See the standard? Paul would say of those Christians, they first gave of themselves. That's why Jesus could give. Because he first gave himself to a lost and dying world. So what could they ask that he would not give? He was willing to give his own life. He was willing to be nailed to a tree. No wonder he was willing to heal the blind. No wonder he was willing to heal that cripple. No wonder he was allowing Nancy this morning as he stood right there and she walked before him. Give her those steps and the strength to accomplish that. He's a giver. Consider what he has given to you. And then let us become like him. I came not to judge, but to save. Oh, that we might have that concept in our own hearts and minds. That we might take up our cross and follow him. In this one thing, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. See, this is why we are givers. That we, our cross, is a lost and dying world. And as he gave his life, as he gave his blood, as he gave his time, as he gave his talent, as he gave his treasures, that's our aim. That's our goal. That we would have a desire for a lost and dying world. We give not selfishly. I don't give to this church that I might get something from it. Except the joy I get from giving itself. We give to mission. That money we place in this bucket. 100% of that money that went into that manger went out the door to mission. We don't keep back a percentage. Oh, well, my wife does have to do the books. We better pay for them. None, none of that comes out of there. None of that. What came into that manger, what came in from those kids, including that 62 cents, went to mission. They had to fight over that last two cents because there's three of them and only those last two cents. But all of that, 1702.62 went out. And our missionaries will receive it and they will put it to work and they will win more so. Because you gave and you pressed it down and then you shook it up a little bit and you squeezed in a little bit. I don't know how you do it. But you did it. We were not the largest of congregations this last year, have we been? But you gave the most that was ever given in this church to missions. Why? Because you pressed it down, then you shook it, and then you poured in a little bit more. And God said, you know what? Those who came with a thimble, I'm going to bless them with a thimble. Those who came to me with a wheelbarrow, I'm going to bless them with a wheelbarrow. You decide how much blessing you want. Me? I'm going to come in with a semi if I have to. I need lots. And let me tell you, God has blessed me with lots. Ask my grandkids. My grandkids will tell you, Grandpa's rich. Now you ask my wife, she say, well, maybe not rich is the way I describe him. But my grandkids see Grandpa as rich. Why? Because God has given. Why? Because I have given to him. And I've given to him myself first. 
And so my grandkids shall call up and call me rich. <laughs> Blessed. They see God. My kids knew that God was involved in my life. That's why they're here. Because God did it. There's no explanation for my life other than God did it. There's no way my wife and I raised five kids. You know how costly these kids these days? We raised five of them. None of them were poor. None of them ever went hungry. Because God was always there. And in this church, God is here also. This was a prayer I made on a Tuesday night. I said, Lord, this offering has to be more than $1,000. It can't go down this year. Because I don't want people to think it's up to us. I want them to know you are here. I prayed that on a Tuesday night. And God said, all right, I'll honor that prayer. Wednesday night I came in here and I preached one of the most upbeat messages I ever preached on a Wednesday night. Because God said, you're going to have this. How much? I just knew it was going to be over a thousand. I knew we were going to break the thousand dollar mark. I had no idea by how much. But God told me, I'm going to hear and answer that prayer. I'm going to show your people that their giving was always from me. And this is his demonstration of his love. And his cooperation with you. As you gave, he threw in an equal measure. And so when we gave, he gave. And when you poured in, he poured in. Then he pressed it down, he poured in a little bit more. So that I'm up to this much. The most this church has ever given in a Christmas offering, ever given in a Christmas offering, was done with the least number of people ever in this church. Christmas Eve service. That's what he does. That's why he says, do you give? Don't judge. Just give. And if we hear it, Take a bar cross and follow him. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Because he's here. And he proved it. He pushed Nancy halfway down this aisle today. I was waiting for him to push her a little bit further. Maybe open that door up. <laughs> three steps. First time, those of you who missed it, Nancy took three steps down this aisle. The first time in how many? Three years? Over three years, the first step she's taken in over three years, she took three of them down this aisle this morning. Huh? Beginning. Just, I like what it says about the Lord. It was the beginning of miracles. It was the beginning of his ministry. I think 2016 may be the beginning of a whole new birth and a whole new life to this church. Let's all stand.